Now I hope you all enjoyed the interview as much as I did. Please allow me to just summarize my key takeaways from the interview. First of all, I think it's important to notice that the heavy duty engines for both on-road and off-road purposes are indispensable for the way we live our lives today in the modern world. So the heavy duty segment though, is responsible for so many things that we rely on, right? The transport of food and goods, construction, agriculture, these are both on-road and off-road applications at work, improving our lifestyles and making sure we have the products we need when we need them, which is very important. So when we talk about improving the transportation sector in terms of efficiency improvements, human health, climate impacts, we need to remember that heavy duty plays a very important role and a very significant role. Secondly, we see that the current legislations have drastically reduced the emissions from the, from the transport sector. Uh, and what is really needed now is to actually exchange the vehicles on the road to have the full benefit of the current legislation. So a combination of emissions regulations and industry innovation has really reduced the harmful emissions that come from not only light duty but heavy duty commercial vehicles. By increasingly tightening the regulated levels of oxides of nitrogen, for example, or particulate matter, heavy duty engines are considerably cleaner than what they were you know, a few years ago, decades ago. This is because of enhancements within the engine itself, right? That's important. We want to clean up the processes, the combustion process within the engine. Uh, for example, fuel injection equipment, modern fuel injection equipment provides much cleaner and more efficient engines, uh, but also the development of advanced after treatment systems, such as diesel oxidation catalysts, particulate filters, you know, DPFs, selective catalytic, catalytic reduction devices, and all of these things work together. And really what we need to remember is incremental changes over the years have really added up to significant improvements, not only in the climate impact of, of these vehicles, but also in the, the human health impact. It's also important to recognize that we haven't seen the full effect of current legislation yet. For example, in Europe, still some you know two thirds of heavy duty vehicles are pre Euro six. So when these are more or less phased out, say as we move towards 2030, the NOx emissions, for example, from this segment is expected to drop, you know, maybe 90% compared to today. And that's without even inventing new technologies. Thirdly, as also stated very clearly, please remember, it's not the engine, it's the fuel. And that also that renewable fuels offer a, a immediate possibility to obtain some of the decarbonization goals we have for the transport sector. We just need to figure out how to go more and more renewable with the fuel, just as we're trying to go more and more renewable with our electrical grid. Right. So it's the same kind of idea. Um, we need to do it with our fuels. There are carbon free. There are carbon neutral options such as hydrogen, e-fuels, biofuels. Um, the biggest challenge, though, is how do we produce these fuels at scale? How do we produce them more efficiently? Um, so this is a big challenge and there's a lot of really great research in this area. And we definitely need to push this forward. What this also allows is to green up the existing fleet. Now to decarbonize the transport, we need to ensure a level playing field. And to ensure a level playing field means that we need to move away from the single look at the tailpipe and go more into life cycle analysis to ensure we understand all parts of the emissions from the transport sector. Number one, the focus needs to move away from the tailpipe. That's the biggest change we can make, and that will go a long way into decarbonizing um, all of these sectors. Now, the biggest way that regulatory agencies can support fast decarbonization for light duty and heavy duty is to change how the regulations are done, as I just mentioned. And we need to use something called life cycle analysis. This allows you to calculate the carbon footprint from all phases of using a vehicle, right? Or a piece of the construction equipment, for example, or a truck. This allows for improved engine technology using hybridization and renewable fuels to be fair, compared fairly to battery electric or fuel cell electric vehicles. And that's really the important point here is we wanna compare these technologies fairly an even, even playing field. And by focusing so much on the tailpipe, it's not a fair comparison. So we need to remove the focus from the tailpipe. Finally, let's all remember the key takeaway there is no silver bullet. There is no one technology. The future is eclectic. 
it's great to think about a future fully renewable grid with batteries in all of our vehicles. Uh, but that's, that's something that maybe will happen in the future. What can we do today to reduce our carbon from, from these vehicles as fast as possible? Uh, we can't wait for the future, right? So we must invoke all the tools in our toolbox to green up this industry. This includes electrification, more efficient combustion, cleaner fuels, and state-of-the-art after-treatment systems. So I call this all-of-above approach eclectic. Now, we've had tremendous success with government setting targets over the years through regulation, as we discussed previously, both for harmful pollutants and greenhouse gases. So let's adjust our targets as we think they should be and move forward with a system that allows the best technology to be used, depending on location and application.